very briefly, uh, this is the St. Elijah Monastery from 595, one of the oldest monasteries in the world. It was also used as a garrison. It's no longer used as a garrison now, because when General Petraeus came, he decided that it should st be stopped. Um, and now they're, um, they're actually surveying, this is for you, for your benefit too, because I know this is a subject you're interested in. Um, so they're actually surveying and doing some work on the site now. Um, uh, military engineers um, and so on. I think this is an issue that we need to discuss as to whether or not this is a good idea, whether it protects the site or whether it may inadvertently actually cause uh, damage. Um, I recently got an email, I think it was yesterday or the day before, that uh, the military is now going to also start doing some uh, conservation work at Stesiphon, uh, which is the second century um, yes, um, and the same for these. This is the American military at this uh, monastery. Um, at one point, the the shrine of Ezekiel, um, which is uh, known to be a Jewish shrine, and it has a Hebrew inscription on the inside. Um, they uh, some soldiers also decided that uh, they wanted to do uh, some work on the roof. And my friend and colleague, Maryam Amran Musa, who uh, is near that area because it's not too far from Babel, um, intervened and said, you know, thank you, thanks, but no thanks. We really would not like help with the restoration of the roof. We'd rather do it ourselves. Um, another issue that we all need to consider, and those of you um, here in the audience uh, probably have more access to this issue than I do, and that is, um, Re uh, reconstruction and development in the post-war period. This has to do with business interests. It has to do with going into uh, a, 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 an ancient city and modernizing it, bringing hotels, uh, bringing things like McDonald's or whatever. Um, and uh, one of the plans for Karbala and also Nejef and Al-Kadom <coughs> was that the streets should be modernized, the old buildings should be torn down, and we should have now new modern buildings, meaning these little narrow, um, you know, darabin should be widened and, and, and made accessible to nice big cars and what have you. So, you know, there is an issue here that relates to uh, global ca uh, capitalism, um, and it's, it's not irrelevant. I mean, all of these things are tied, and I don't think that we've, um, you know, made the connections clearly enough yet. Um, I think we have to be very clear about what's going on here. It's not just the kind of an inadvertent loss of global cultural heritage. There's a great deal more that's going on here. So places like Karbala, Neja, Kalbam, we need to just say no. Don't go into our medieval and ancient and 16th century cities and destroy you know, the, the ancient urban planning. Um, so Nineveh, they started to also recently uh, build on the ancient walls of Nineveh using cement, um, which is of course something that is unacceptable. At one point a road was going to be built through the ancient royal city of Nineveh. A, a National Library and the State Archive, although it's not an area of expertise for me because I'm an archeologist, and an art historian, when I first went to Iraq, I thought I would have nothing to do with this. It's not my area of work. But I really got pulled into it because how can you not care when you go there and you find out that 60% of the national archive, that 60% of the documents of Iraq's history going back to the 15th century are gone, are destroyed. 60% of Iraq's history going back to the 16th century and the 15th century are destroyed. Um, what was left was a major mess. Uh, the archives were uh, drowned. They, they became also um, fungus grew into them, so they had to be dried. There was no electricity um, to, to uh, deal with them. Uh, this is Saad Iskender, Dr. Saad Iskender, who is now the director of the National mm -hmm. Library, and I'm also here to remind you that he has completely reopened, restored, and started working the National Library and State Arch Archives on a shoestring budget with really no assistance at all. 
And what he's done is nothing short of a miracle. I think his work is remarkable, as is Maria Musa's work, and many other scholars and um, archaeologists in Iraq whose work it has not been acknowledged um, enough. Um, this is just an image of the library of how it looked and what they had to do to it. It was burned, the pages were destroyed. This is Wishyar Muhammad, another Iraqi librarian, and he's pointing to the frozen archive. This, um, the, the arc, what was left of the archive, which was wet and, and mildewed, uh, we found out, or they found out, um, from colleagues um, in the US that what you have to do with them is that you have to freeze them in order to stop the mildew from growing and actually destroying the remainder of the archives. Um, but of course there was no place to freeze them because in 2003 and 2004 there was no electricity so there were no freezers and there we were with 60% of the country's documented history destroyed, the other 40% pretty much about to be destroyed. Why? Because there weren't any freezers to put this, this archive that needed to be frozen, just for incredibly silly reasons that would not happen anywhere in the world. Um, they were able to begin to slowly dry them out, so that's um, now under control. And just for my final slide, um, I want to turn back to the past because for me the reason that I am in this field is because I find it so fascinating um, that the ancient Mesopotamians and in my own research and writing this is what I think about and investigate how the ancient Mesopotamians themselves were perhaps one of the first cultures to, to really have a historical consciousness to be really aware of the passage of time and the, the notion of the pastness of the past, if I can use such an expression. And I think that there are a couple of reasons for this. One of them is that the way that, that tells or mounds accumulate there. It's a flat land. When you see a tell, you know it's an ancient site. It can be nothing else. And these tells, you know, <coughs> tens, uh, more than 10,000 of them, dot the landscape, north and south. And every time you see one, you are aware it's a, it's a site that's thousands of years old. Of course, these tells were already there in antiquity, and the ancients write about them, and they're aware that there are you know, ancient sites. And the ancient kings um, wrote about restoring sanctuaries. This is Esar Hadan, a king, an Assyrian king from the seventh century BC. He's one of many kings, he's not the only one. He's one of many kings who restored an ancient sanctuary, uh, the sanctuary of the goddess Inanna at Uruk. Inanna later becomes Ishtar. The sanctuary of Inanna at Uruk um, dates back to the fourth millennium BC. That beautiful he alabaster head I showed you in the beginning, this is where it comes from. So uh, that temple dates to about 3,500 BC. Esar Hadon lived in the 7th century BC, and he restored that sanctuary, and he wrote about restoring it and preserving it as an ancient site, and why it was an important thing to do that, feeling very strongly that this was part of the identity and the history of the land, and of his own identity and his history. So this, this idea of the knowledge of the past and caring about the past is, is, is not something that's modern. It's something that people have always been um, aware of, at Greece in the time of Pericles. Um, it's longer than the time <coughs> between uh, Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon and the establishment of the modern nation state of Iraq after the fall of the Ottoman Empire. Just to give you an idea of the extent of the passage of time. So they, the ancients were very aware of this and the way that they understood ancient monuments and works of art was they understood them to have agency and they understood them to have a kind of a, an agency that was directly related to their own identity as they called themselves the black-headed peoples, to their own identity of the people of that land the people of that area. 
Um, so for us to think that moderns are the first people ever to have a historical awareness um, is completely incorrect. So I'll, I'll stop here.